This morning, I'm going to focus on several related areas regarding floods. Firstly, how to prevent floods in our buildings. And second, what to do and what to expect in the event of a flood. How do we prevent water leaks? I'm going to list around a half a dozen very simple um, guidelines in terms of reducing water leaks in your building. First and foremost, only allow approved contractors to do in-suite work. For example, plumbers, electricians, HVAC, and appliance technicians. These, a plumber, for example, who specializes in residential homes and has an expertise in a one-floor bungalow might not have the technical knowledge necessary to function properly in a 40-floor condominium building. So you need an appropriate contractor as the experience to work in your building. The second major reason how to prevent floods in our building is the old saying, maintenance, maintenance, and more maintenance. Three of the major causes of floods can be avoided by in-suite inspections. For example, washing machine hoses. You know, it's a $25 part that either frequently detaches or becomes porous over time. You know, we service a downtown building that after around two years after registration, they started finding washing machine hoses started popping. And they had around five or six floods in around a one month period of time. But the building proactively recognized the issue and replaced all the washing machine hoses in the building. What we recommend is to have regular maintenance. So to inspect them, to make sure they A, are structurally sound, and B, are secured properly. The second area that increased maintenance will prevent floods dramatically would be toilet, toilet overflows. Obviously, regular inspections to include all the fittings are secure. All the fittings are secure. I've just been reminded, I've been delinquent in my duties here. There we go. Aha. We are talking about the F word now. Sorry, guys. All the fittings are secure. One simple test to do in a toilet would be to put a little food dye in the tank and then see if the dye appears into the bowl. Obviously, if there is transference of the food dye, you know some of the seals have been compromised and maintenance is required. Another area of improved maintenance would detract floods are obviously balcony leaks and roof leaks, which are very timely this time of year. They are very weather related, obviously, and what we find with balcony leaks and roof leaks is usually the same units get flooded each and every time it rains. Balcony leaks, from our experience, are usually as simple as proper caulking, and a $20 caulking job might prevent thousands and thousands of dollars worth of damage. Rooftop uh, repairs regarding townhouses are usually a little bit more extensive and more complicated. But the point I'd like to add is that in all these flooding, we seem to go to the same units repeatedly, over and over and over again. And when you don't look after a balcony leak or you don't look after a rooftop leak, what happens is generally mold will create over time because of the ongoing exposure to moisture. So in many cases, simple maintenance and inspection will reduce these number of floods. The next area I'd like to talk about that probably have the most dramatic in impact and is probably the most challenging is communication with residents. Obviously by clear communication and by educating residents clearly you're going to reduce the number of floods dramatically. Now let's talk about some examples of that. For example if you were to communicate to your residents that you do not flush kitty litter down the toilet or down the kitchen drain. For example if you were to communicate to your residents that before, during, and after a water shutoff, that is occurring, so they can properly prepare. I have yet to have a building we look after with a water shutoff that there's not at least one flood occurrence. I would remind the residents not to leave their apartments with running water, whether it's their bathtub, obviously, or whether it's the dishwasher or the washing machine. I would suggest to your residents 
that when they're out of town for, for long periods of time, to have someone inspect their units every couple of days. When we talk about the M word, that's mold, I will show you an example of what happens when you can leave a unit unattended. And the last thing I would instruct property managers to communicate clearly with their residents about whether condominium or residential rental units is to have their own personal insurance, okay? Um, no matter whose cause the flood is, no matter who's looking after it, there will always be personal liability. And I have to admit, I go to a lot of different flood scenes, and if every time I go to a flood scene with multiple units, at least one person will ask me, oh, excuse me, are, are you the guy who's going to pay for my hotel? So obviously, if people have their insurance in place, it makes your job as a property manager significantly easier. Yes, now luck is not on your side. And it has happened, you have a flood. Hopefully you respond better visually than that, but yes. What I'm going to discuss now is what to do in the event of a flood and what to expect when your property floods. <clears throat> First foremost is the safety and the safety of your residents. It should be your number one concern. So obviously, do not touch any wet electrical wires, appliance, or devices. If you feel the electricity has been compromised in any manner, get out immediately, call Toronto Hydro. You know, the key to minimizing damage in floods is a quick response. If you feel it is safe to proceed, please enter the unit, and if able, shut off the water. If you're not able to shut off the water, please contact the plumber immediately and they'll shut off the water. As I said to you, an early response lessens the damage. At that point, contact your emergency service company. God willing, Spectrum will be first and foremost on your mind, but please call us. You should expect a one hour response or less period. And simply put, and I'll say this over and over again, the quicker they get there, the less amount of damage you're going to have to deal with down the road. If you're able to, while you're waiting for the emergency service crew, please inspect units below and maybe outline units to assess if there is more additional damage than the source unit flood. Once the emergency service team arrives, their process is very simple and very standard. The first priority is extracting all water. As you see from our slides, there's two methods of extraction. The one on the right, which is more common, is called a portable extractor. And the one on the left is a truck mount, where through a hose, it'll enter through the whole building and extract it. This, if you look at the previous flood there, and the picture on the right, that's a City of Toronto backup. And it encased around the P1 level almost to its entirety. Now obviously, as you can see by the volumes of water, a portable extractor will have little or no effect. So in that particular situation, you would need a truck mount or a pump to, reg to circulate and get the water out of there. <clears throat> the first priority, as I mentioned, is removing the water. The next, once the removal of the water, all affected areas that are wet, drywall, baseboard, flooring, carpet, usually the underpad. Removal of these wet affected materials, it will allow proper drying and will prevent the growth of mold. After all the affected areas are removed, these areas are there disinfected and deodorized. Usually at this point, drying equipment is put in place. You see there's a couple of different pictures here. You have two different machines. You have first air movers, which will circulate the air. The second machine in the back is called a dehumidifier. That will draw the moisture out of the air. The elaborate looking gadget you see on the right hand side of your screen is a uh, device used for drying up uh, wooden floors and laminate flooring. Another, another test that, uh, another tool that your emergency service company will have is what's called a FLIR gun, F-L-I-R. That's a picture of it on the right. The image it projects is on the left. 
and what it has the ability to do is take a thermal image behind the wall. So meaning, you can point your FLIR gun at a wall and it will demonstrate this picture which shows if you look at the purple and the blue areas would indicate the moisture. So before any wall cutting is done, before any recommendations are done, they will see what areas are wet and which areas are being affected. I might add as well, when drying is complete, they will use this as well to ensure that the walls have been properly dried. The normal drying time takes around three days and after the unit is fully dry, well, I got ahead of myself, sorry guys. After the unit is fully dry, restoration can then begin. In closing on floods, I'd like to summarize. Preventive maintenance is imperative. Communications with residents is vital. It doesn't matter if it's four o'clock in the morning, call your emergency service crew immediately. Again, the quicker the response, the less amount of damages. Four, rely on professionals. For example, if you have your super sucking up the water, he doesn't know that there's a different protocol involved for dirty water as opposed to washing machine water. As well as when I was saying rely on professionals, as we spoke about earlier, only have approved contractors doing in-suite work with electrical, plumbing, HVAC, and appliances. And the last point I'd leave you in summarizing floods is the most important probably for property managers during a flood is to know your standard unit bylaw. So you can make correct decisions and you can give correct direction to the emergency flood company when they arrive. Now, what happens if you've had a problem and you haven't looked after it? And yes, I was a little premature before, but it's time we talk about that bad M word, mold. Mold is the name of a fungi that grows inside people's homes. Mold is present in some degree in all indoor and outdoor environments. It is the levels and the relative levels that cause concern. Mold needs four things to grow. It needs time. It takes at least 24 hours for mold to grow. It needs temperature. Room temperature is ideal, or a few degrees warmer will certainly do the trick. It needs a food source. Drywall, baseboards, flooring seem to fill that need, and it needs moisture. Mold needs moisture to grow. And growth we see here. Earlier on I was referring to a unit, why it's important to check your uh, vacant unit every couple of days. The pictures here demonstrate a unit that's probably the most advanced mold I've seen in any residential condominium unit. The occupant was a professor who was on a year sabbatical. As he left, he was rushing to the airport and I guess he didn't fully turn off his shower and left the hot water just dripping. Three months later, after they detected a horrible smell emanating from his apartment, they entered and this is what they found. So there's several ways to identify mold. Obviously here, you don't have to be a real mold graduate to figure out there is a visible inspection. Like people, mold comes in all shapes and colors. Mold can be black, it can be blue, it can be red, it can be orange, it can be purple, and it can be yellow. I forgot white. It will grow in clusters generally and will appear furry or fuzzy. It is common to find it in the top of the room, the ceiling areas, or on, oh, or on the bottom of the areas, near the baseboards and drywall by the flooring. Another way that one usually detects mold is by the odor. Mold has a particularly musty, earthy smell. Since mold thrives in moist, warm environments, it is quite common that there will be this moldy smell. However, to definitively assess a mold risk in your environment, an air testing is required. This will allow one to know what kind of mold is present and in what concentration levels. After your visual and odor inspections, and confirmed by a certified air test, a remediation plan 
can be erected. On the right there is an example of a, um, an air test where it will show the different types of mold present and the levels and the elevations of it. The reason mold makes people sick is because mold spores become airborne and enter our bodies through inhalation. As well, and this is very important in terms of remediation, once mold spores become airborne, they can enter other areas of the building. And if conditions are right, there is a potential to create mold in more than one environment, location, cross-contamination, spreading. So understanding that separation of the environment is essential in mold remediation. And the process is called containment. Now some of you might have noticed this kind of funny looking device on my right, on your left. It looks like, a, I guess, a telephone booth, or am I dating myself by that reference? And that's a little portable mini um, mold containment chamber that we have uh, built for our purposes here today. I'd like to take this time to introduce a colleague of mine from Spectrum, Mr. Ray Kocheski, who is a certified mold assessor. And Ray is going to show you how, number one, a containment chamber works, and number two, what the mold remediation process works. Ray? Thank you very much. My name is Ray. I work at Spectrum Building Services with Fred. Uh, my job essentially is to go into mold infested areas like people's homes, people's units, and to determine what needs to be done to fix their mold problem. So I'm going to kind of run you through the steps that we take in order to properly rectify and clear out mold in a safe manner. Once we've established that there is a mold problem, we need to make sure that the technicians that go inside are properly protected from the mold. We do this by endowing our technicians in personal protective gear. As you can see, the picture on your right there is a person who has the full protective equipment on. The protective equipment includes a Tyvek suit, which is that white suit with the hood. They need to have that on in order to protect the technician from their skin being affected by some of the cleaning agents that are used and also to make sure that none of the mold spores spread all over them as they remediate the mold. The technicians will also have rubber gloves on and that is again to protect them from any of the chemicals that are used to clean anything up and again to protect them from having any mold spores caught on their hands after they leave the job site. The most important part of the personal protective equipment is the mask. As you can see in this picture, we have a gentleman with a full face mask on. That will protect him from breathing in the mold spores as he's cutting out the mold infested materials. On the left here, this is a air cassette which you put inside of the mask and it filters out the air as they're working. So as they're cutting the mold infested materials, they're kind of spreading mold throughout the air and this way they don't, the technicians don't breathe it in as they're cutting out the mold. Okay, so step number two is to contain the mold within an area. We do obviously don't want the mold spores spreading, we don't want people to be breathing in the mold, so we have to contain it. To do that, we erect what is called a containment chamber. And you can see two of them here from jobs that we've done. And we also have one containment chamber set up over here, which I'm going to demonstrate in just a minute. I'll explain to you what a containment chamber does and why it's effective in mold remediation. A containment chamber is essentially a big room made from plastic that encloses all the moldy areas. We also have an air filter inside of the containment chamber to clean out the air and it also creates the negative pressure that's used. As you can see in the picture on the right, we have a couple of air scrubbers or air filters that are helping to clean the air as the technicians work inside. The air filters, like I mentioned, create a negative air pressure inside of the containment chamber. What this does is it draws air into the containment chamber, and that way if there's any holes in the containment chamber, there's only clean air coming in. Now, the air scrubbers also push air out, but before it pushes the moldy air out, it filters the air. 
so that way only clean air is coming in and only clean air is coming out. So I'm going to demonstrate how the containment chamber works using the containment chamber over here. So I'm just going to go. So I'd like you to imagine that our spectrum logo in the back here is a bunch of really nasty black mold. We need to clean it up. So what we're going to do is we would have a technician build the containment chamber. They step inside of the containment chamber. We close it to make sure that none of the mold spores that we you know, cut open are going to be flying all over the room. We will then turn on the air filter in order to suck out any of the mold. So Fred, can you turn it on for me? So as the air filter goes on, you'll see that the containment chamber starts to shrink. And there you go, you can see that the air scrubber inside is pulling all the air. It's pushing it out through this exhaust right here. And the air that's coming out of there is extremely clean because it's being filtered as it goes out. So after we've cut out all the materials inside the containment chamber, we need to make sure that anything that's in there that was touched by the air is cleaned. To do that, we need to spray it down with what's called a biocide. A biocide is basically a mold killing liquid that we use in order to do our mold remediation. You can see a bottle of it here. It's made by Benefact. Once everything is kind of scrubbed and rubbed down, as you can see in this picture on the right, we use a, a HEPA vacuum in order to get rid of any of the remaining mold spores. And that is right here, as you can see. So a HEPA vacuum is basically a really high-end vacuum with a very, very specific kind of air filter on it. And what it does is it sucks out any of the dead mold spores and makes sure that they're filtered uh, before we can go on to the next step of our remediation. So now that everything's cleaned up, we would take down our containment chamber, take down all the plastic wrap, and you can call in a mold assessment company to do follow-up air testing. Now the reason that people do follow-up air testing for this is because they want to make sure that all the mold has been completely eliminated. You might have a resident as well who's complaining, oh, maybe they didn't get some of the mold. Well, the clearance air sampling uh, would clarify if all the mold is gone. So companies like Pynchon or Echo could come in, they do air sampling, as you can see in this photo here, and they could write you a report basically saying, you know what, all the mold is completely gone and everything's safe. Uh, that's about all that I have for you. Thank you very much for coming out. I really appreciate it, and I hope you enjoyed this demonstration. Thank you very much for coming, and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you.